Goodness gracious, chat. How are we doing? Late start today. Had to do some errands, had to do some meal prep. Had to get shit ready ahead of Easter Sunday because I cooking a bunch of food. Oh, so here's where we left off on this. I just did some cleaning on the colors. This is essentially done. I have to flip a couple things and polish off a couple spots, but yeah, the last time we worked on it was day nine. I gave myself 10 days max. I'm fully confident this will be done by the 10 day deadline I gave myself. So I had a meeting with my client last night and we talked about stuff we want to prioritize, things we want to do. And basically they told me uh, they want me to go full in on Elden Ring. So I will finish this this week. This will be done. But today we are going to hop back over to Big Ol' Snake Man and wrap this up so I can clean my plate and start my third and final Elden Ring piece on stream so that's the plan going forward um we're gonna knock this out hopefully this week we'll see this week's weird i gotta go to the hospital for some stuff but we're gonna do the best we can um but this is essentially done there's a few little spots but we have one more full day to work on this i'm gonna put this aside for today and we are going to go all in on Mr. Snake Man. Snake Man is about 70% done. Uh, because this is a poster. This is not a t-shirt. It's a poster. And that means that all this stuff has to get hyper detailed because it's going to print at 24 by 36. So there's a bunch of areas. I'm actually going to make a priority layer of what I'd like to focus on so I don't get too lost in the minutia. Um, this, let's see. Finishing up this is a big one. Making this asymmetrical is another one. Uh, bringing this up over into here and bringing that up to there is part of that. Finishing off the chandelier. Um, I have to render these hands. I gotta render all this viscera. I gotta make this asymmetrical because right now it's a flip of the other one. I gotta do these bodies. All these bodies have to be in here. This is the final thing to do. Render the face out. And then these cages have to get done. These got to get rendered. And then general uh, border. That has to get done. Tighten that. Flip it. And then the chains. The chains are gonna be a bitch. Sword has to get done too. So there's a, there's a few areas that need a lot of attention. It's gonna be a few days of this, maybe a full week. Uh, but yeah, it's close enough that all the hard work is done. I just have to render. That has to get done, this has to get done. This has to get done. All right. Turn those off. Go to my layer. Nice.
All right, chat. I'd also like to find some time this week, maybe tonight, who knows, to start studying and clip. I have a piece I want to do to teach myself how to do clip. I sketched it out. I'd like to do it. So maybe we'll hop over into clip one of these days. I'm going to do today, I'm going to try to do this thing and this viscera. I'm going to start with the viscera because this is an easy thing to just kind of render out. Let me see if I have, I do, okay. I do have some reference available that I had opened. Let's see, what else? I'm tired today, guys. I'm sorry. I was up all night with food poisoning. I made some steak that turned out to be questionable. And it uh, kept me up all night. Okay, started to render this. All right. Most of these aren't fully formed hands. Some of them are. So I'm gonna do a, a couple, a couple fully formed hands. As family. It's my favorite Elden Ring boss, guys. One of my favorite boss designs in any video game I've ever played. Shout out to everyone who was with us the other day for the 14 hours of streaming. 11 hours here on my channel and then uh, a nice stream over on Dave's shortly after. That was quite a day. Quite a day. Join the Sippin' King.
tomorrow I think there will be a stream, but it really depends how fucking tired I am after Easter. Um, I gotta cook a bunch of food, I gotta see some family. Um, I'm assuming I'll be home by like 3 EST, maybe stream around 5 or something, but if I, I don't know. It's gonna be the first meal I've had in a long time, since Christmas. It's gonna be the first meal I've had that has like food that isn't on my diet, and I don't know if that's gonna make me super sick. So we're gonna, tomorrow's gonna be winging it. I might stream, I might not. If my body rejects the food, then uh, no stream. Yeah, this boss is a gimmick boss. You don't have to use the spear, but oh boy. This guy is also hard to draw because a lot of him breaks rules. Like some finger, some hands have seven fingers. Some have three fingers and some have five. So <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting to be like, okay, where am I going to break the rules? Where am I going to stick to the rules? Let's see.
Um, happy birthday to your wife. Carrot cake's delicious. Does Godric have more than... Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Godric might have more than five. I know Rikard does for sure. And those hand enemies that run around that look like Rikard's hands. It's weird because these, um, if you look at the model, these hands are like not fully formed. They're like weird, like jelly, like homunculus hands. Like some of them are still in the process of growing. They're like, they're really weird looking. You can see up here, I rendered these. They do this weird thing where like some flail around and some have knuckles and some don't. They're like very, they're very odd. I don't want to reuse a ton of hands. I'd like to, I don't want to like copy paste, maybe with a couple, but. Yeah, they're pretty pronounced. No, there's no hiding hands. The most difficult part of his regular hands, not the little baby ones, is uh, getting the rings right. He's wearing like a million rings. I think I am having a guest come over at some point this afternoon. I don't know when they're going to show up, though, so I might have to dip. But once they leave, I will come back on. Someone's coming over to take a look at my, uh, my outdoor situation and see if I can put an extension on part of the house. Not for a room, just for um, to block, for like storage, basically, like a like an attached shed. Because I'm very tired of waking up and finding my pieces of my yard out in the lake. Not the best feeling. It's going to be a lot of noodling. I apologize.
Something about this feels wrong. Hey, puppy. Hi, puppy. Come here. Come here. Come here. Good dog. Which non-diet food am I looking forward to the most? Uh, there's an old recipe it's like 200 years old that has been in my family cookbook forever. My grandmother used to make it for every holiday. Um, it's called creamed onions. You take, you take pearl onions and you boil them to get the skin off. You remove the skin so they're like little pearl onions. You parboil them so they're soft. Then you saute them so they're like golden brown on the outside. Then you make a roux. And you make a bechamel, which is a heavy cream-based sauce. And you put uh, fresh grated Parmesan cheese into the sauce. You make like a cheese mornay over the onions. And you uh, crush up Ritz crackers and you sprinkle them over the top and you bake it until it's like golden and bubbly. So it's like a cheese, cream, onion. It, it's incredible. It's my favorite thing ever. It's especially good with prime rib. Um, but I'm doing a leg of lamb tomorrow and a stuffed turkey. But uh, it's the best with prime rib. But it'll still be good. I'm going to still count calories tomorrow. I'm just going to change the foods I'm eating. So I think I can have... Because there's cream in it. I used light cream this time to save some calories. But I think I can have maximum like one cup of those onions tomorrow and still keep my, my calories in check. So I can't have a ton of them, but I am looking forward to eating them. I'm probably gonna get sick because that's pretty rich. That's a pretty rich thing. Menu I'm cooking for tomorrow for the family is a leg of lamb studded with garlic and rosemary, roasted in the oven with a red wine reduction with mint jelly on the side i'm going to do roasted tomatoes to go with it there's going to be uh mashed potatoes herb mashed potatoes there's going to be the um, creamed onions there's going to be a yorkshire pudding under the roast to collect the drippings um, there's going to be a stuffed turkey uh, with obviously stuffing, cranberry, <clears throat> cranberry chutney. Um, there's going to be fresh asparagus, uh, almondine with slivered almonds and some some brown butter. Uh, am I forgetting anything? What am I forgetting? Doing strawberry shortcake for dessert. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting an entree or a vegetable or something, but Cooking for, well, I cooked a lot of it today. That's why my stream is starting so late. I prepped a lot of it. The only thing I'm doing tomorrow is the roasts. Everything else is basically done. Um, cooking for about 20, 15 to 20.
We're not even religious, like none of us are. Easter is just a thing that my grandparents did, so we kept the tradition going. But, yeah. You gotta get up early, hide some Easter eggs around the yard for my nephew to find, and then uh, get the roasts in the oven, and then just kind of babysit them. How early am I up to cook? If I was doing it all on the day, like for Thanksgiving, if I'm doing most of it the day of, I get up at like 5 a.m. and I cook till 1, and then people show up at 1. But because I did it in batches this time, I did some today. I woke up at like 9, cooked until about 1, one thirty, then ran a few more errands. Nothing about this was like, I'm not doing like twice baked potatoes or anything that are super time consuming. I just did mashed potatoes. Studying the roast was is easy. Making the stuffing is relatively easy. Stuffing is only time consuming if you make your own breadcrumbs, which I didn't do this time. I combined a pack of Bell Season breadcrumbs with a pack of stove top with a pack of generic and then uh, mixed it with my own bread that I soaked in chicken broth and threw in the sauteed vegetables and Bell Seasoning, some herbs. But yeah, if you do stuff from scratch, like for the big holidays, like from Christmas and Thanksgiving, I do everything from scratch. That's time consuming. I did not know that Dead Man's Pixels, but that's pretty great. I did find a sphinx shrine in dragon's dogma last night but there was no sphinx there and i was like excuse me this looks super cool what do i do but yeah Thank you. Thank you, Terg. Yeah, I post a lot of the stuff I cook on there. I do love cooking. It's an old pastime for me that I've been doing since I was seven years old. These hands are so weird. They're like intentionally wrong on the model. It's super infuriating to paint. most blasphemous join the sipping king as family I love I love the voice actor for this it's like borderline Emperor Palpatine voice acting
What's up, Artie? Uh, excuse me, Mike Staclasa does the best Palpatine. Seth MacFarlane's is pretty damn good too, though. I'm going to try a Hail Mary. I'm going to try a Hail Mary on Google. I'm going to type in, let's take a look. I'm going to type in Best Dreamcast Music. Dreamcast Music Greatest Hits. One hour. Let's see. Hmm. Even just that sound is off to a good start. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. Okay. What's this, Sonic Adventure? This sounds like Sonic Adventure. Like the level where you fight the whale, or the whale jumps over you, not fight the whale. Like I can hear Sonic's voice over this music line. Wow! Oh no! Oh, that's very funny for you guys. You can't hear it. Interesting. What is OBS doing then? Oh, weird. Hmm, hold on. Very interesting. You got it now? You hear now? See what I mean? This sounds very Sonic Adventure. Got it.
If anyone knows what this track is from, please tell me. It sounds like Sonic Adventure. he got for me Dreamcast Oh, you know what? I didn't post on Instagram that I'm streaming. Give me one second, chat. Switching it up. We did it. We did it. Hey, you're right. Hope you are too.
listening to the Samurai Shampoo vinyl collection. How'd my style emerge? Uh, right now I'm doing kind of a JC Line Decker thing where I'm, I'm emphasizing the strokes over the blending. So like everything is like a shape. You can like see the brush stroke fade up. Like it's all very like angles and shapes and the shapes curl with the forms. Like it's, that's kind of what it is. It's a way of like drawing with your paintbrush that JC Line Decker, Golden Age Illustrator did. Um, If you look at his work, you can see down here, like, you can just see the brush strokes, like, curling around the edges and stuff. Like, it's very, everything is very chunky and very angular. Like, if you look at this, like, leg on the night, like, the highlights just curl with the form. It's just, like, he's just carving things out and he's not spending a ton of time blending it. It's just big. I like it a lot. But, yeah, that's essentially what I'm doing. Hello, draw. Yeah, that might be fun. We could play Exquisite Corpse. That's where everybody draws one part of an animal. We hand it over to the next person and they draw the next part of the animal. I would draw a torso and the next person would draw one of the arms and the next person would draw the hand and so on and so on. Mix and match.
If you had to guess, where do you think Amano got his reference and inspiration for the early Final Fantasy games? I'm guessing Klimt is an inspiration. What about the big summons and monsters? Um, Amano pulled from a bunch of stuff. Klimt is definitely one of them. Alphonse Muka is definitely one of them. There's a lot of um, traditional Japanese painters whose names I don't know off the top of my head who did ink paintings of like old yokai and monsters and stuff like old ink wash paintings of stuff that he's absolutely pulling from, especially in his like Tale of Genji stuff. Um, like this, any anything with like a woman reclining with really long hair, with the dark makeup, with like the flowy fabrics, like that's all definitely from traditional Japanese ink wash painters. And you know, there's a huge range of influences. Um, he definitely was a fan of Frazetta. He's said that in interviews, especially a lot of his like iconic fantasy work. He pulled compositions and some character stuff from Frank Frazetta. Amano didn't like drawing um, like muscle naked bodies. He, he liked the costumes and the design side of it more. But a lot of that came from um, a lot of that came from Art Nouveau. But yeah, he's definitely uh, he's pulling from a few different things. Frazetta and the modern fantasy movement was one of them. Alphonse Mucha was a huge one. Not Alphonse Mucha's advertising stuff so much as Alphonse Mucha's book illustrations. Um, stuff from like Le Pater and things he's pulling from. Um, yeah, but there's a ton of traditional Japanese ink wash painting for like fantasy books and folk tales that Amano, I'd say 50% of his style came from. For sure. He's also pulling from a lot of pop culture. Like, um, a lot of the summons and the monsters are just from other things. Like, uh, all the Final Fantasy 1 monster illustrations were basically lifted from the uh, first edition D&D monster manual. Like, some of them were, like, borderline copied, like the Mind Flayers and stuff. But, um, obviously he put his spin on them. There's a lot of old 70s and 80s anime influence in there, too. Anytime he draws a robot or something technical, there's a ton of anime influence in there. Which makes sense, considering, you know, he got his start doing Vampire Hunter D and other things like that. But, yeah. If you watch, um, like, Angel's Egg or any of the animated stuff Amano worked on, you can see a lot of the stuff he was looking at in there. There's there's a, a ton of Alphonse Mucha in Angel's Egg. Any scene where the girl is drifting and her hair comes out in the rivulets, it's, like, direct reference to Art Nouveau stuff. There's also an interesting tennis match between him and other contemporary artists where like he would do monsters that were based off monsters for Dragon Quest and Dragon Quest would throw things in that were homages to Amano and yeah. You also have to remember that starting with Final Fantasy 3, more so than Amano, I think Tetsuya Nomura was one of the best enemy designers they ever had in terms of just the art. A lot of the iconic stuff from Final Fantasy 5 and 6 was not Amano, it was Nomura. If you play Final Fantasy VI and you look at like the Atma weapon or the three goddesses, um, those were all designed by Nomura. They weren't designed by Amano. They gave him a directive to try and make everything look like it fit Amano's style, which he did very well. But a lot of those ideas were not Amano's ideas. A lot of those were Nomura's ideas, which... He was a very good enemy designer. I just don't like his main character designs as much because they lean into fashion and tropes and things. But his monster designs are excellent. Um, all those awesome pixel bosses were like super, super cool. Those were basically all him. Yeah. 
if you uh, there's a great villain at the end of Final Fantasy VI called Goddess, who they specifically told Nomura they wanted him to do. You know, we want these to feel ethereal. We want you to do Yoshitaka Amano, and he would do Nomura would do drawings like this that were like you know extremely Amano, but they were they were his creations. They weren't Amano's creations. A lot of the iconic shit. Um, yeah, I think I think the one I think Amano did design the rough idea for the Magitek armor, but I think Nomura is the one who actually fleshed it out. Like Amano did a few, he did that one iconic painting of Terra in it, and then they took that and they designed all the rest of the technology in the game based on that. So Amano designed the Magitek, and then Nomura designed everything else after that based on that one painting as like an aesthetic reference. But uh, yeah. In the final game, uh, Nomura's art translated into stuff like this, which was really cool. He would do these concept drawings, and then they would turn them into these amazing pixel art renditions that are super iconic. But, yeah. No, those were all done by Nomura. Nomura being given the assignment to make everything look like it was done by Amano. That's how he got his start, was because Amano had so much work and he was so successful that he couldn't do, because, you know, the Final Fantasy games need hundreds of monsters and, you know, close to a hundred bosses and main characters and key art and concept art. So Amano couldn't do all that. He just, it just wasn't possible. So starting with Final Fantasy, I believe three, they gave Amano an art team of other people working under him to help him, you know, get all the stuff done. And then eventually around Final Fantasy V, definitely with VI and absolutely with VII, they phased Amano out to only doing the promotional images and the key art for the aesthetic feel of the game. Then art teams came in and did everything else. Starting with Final Fantasy VII, they phased Amano out completely and only had him do logo design. Um, there is some concept art out there he did it post post development, like. They built the game and they used Nomura's designs because when they switched to PlayStation, there weren't enough, like in pixel art, you can take Amano stuff and you can do a 2D representation because it doesn't have to move. It's just a static representation of his artwork sitting on the screen. But once they got into FF7 and stuff had to be animated, there weren't enough polygons uh, at their disposal to make Amano's work look like Amano's work. It just looked really shitty. So they were like, we have to switch art styles and do something more simplified. They landed on anime. They were like, we're gonna have to go with more of an anime look because that translates to 3D much easier than this Baroque Amano stuff. So they had Nomura design all the characters for Final Fantasy VII. And then um, after Nomura designed them, they gave them to Amano and said, can you do some key art images in your style based on Nomura's you know, stuff? So you will see some images out there from Amano for FF7, but they were done after the fact. They weren't done as the lead designer. Um, and then after FF7 for FF8 and uh, not 9, they brought Amano back to do the character art in 9. But um, for FF7 and 8 and 10 and stuff going forward, they basically had Nomura be the, the, head, the head designer. And Amano was just kind of relegated to key art and logo design. But, yeah. They've yet to do a game that looks like Amano's art in 3D. Because it would probably be very hard to do. The closest game is, surpri is actually, surprisingly, Final Fantasy XIV has the most Amano designs in 3D. Does Nomura have an art book? Um... Honestly, the best art books to see all Nomura's stuff are the Final Fantasy art books, the Ultimanias and things. Like, those have more... I don't think Nomura has a book of just, hey, I'm Nomura, here's my stuff. I think his stuff is mostly compiled in the Final Fantasy art books. I could be wrong, though. There might, there might be a book out there I just haven't seen. But, yeah... Hold on.
Yeah, that's dope. Be super cool. I'd love it if they did something like that. Dead Man's Pixels. But yeah, so. That being said, even with Final Fantasy IX, they originally tried to make it look like a Mano's paintings and it's still, the PlayStation just wasn't powerful enough. So then they swapped very early on to that chibi style that the game ended up being. But they kept the Mano's designs for the characters. They just redid them in a chibi form. It is possible now, they could do it. They could absolutely do it. It's just a question of do they want to. The, um, the big rumor that everybody got hyped about before Stranger of Paradise came out, there was a rumor going around before that announcement that they were going to remake uh, Final Fantasy 1 and it was going to be in a complete Amano art style open world RPG the way they did um, the new 7 you know, Rebirth. And it was going to be all of Amano's original designs rendered in 3D. And then it turns out it was Stranger of Paradise because they subcontracted it to somebody who decided a regular modern looking white guy with fucking Limp Biscuit music would be more marketable or some shit. But yeah, that was a huge letdown. I, w I would have loved to see that. But they might do something going forward. If Final Fantasy IV gets a remake or if VI gets a remake, they're probably going to stick to Amano's art pretty closely. And Murray did all the enemy art for those games, but, you know, it's in Amano's aesthetic. But yeah, Amano, growing up, Yoshitaka Amano and Tetsuya Nomura were my two favorite artists. Up until PlayStation 2, when, like, the Kingdom Hearts art aesthetic took over, then I kind of fell off. But everything, like, Final Fantasy 1 through, like, 9, I know almost everything about the development process because I was like obsessed um, especially with Amano by the way if you didn't know the only reason Yoshitaka Amano ever got hired to work on Final Fantasy is because when Hironobu Sakaguchi got tasked with making Final Fantasy before the company went bankrupt, um, the only thing he could do was emulate Dragon Quest, because that was at the time the biggest RPG in Japan. And he copied Dragon Quest as much as he could. And one of the things he copied, you know, he, he basically wrote down the recipe for its success. It was a small team, it was like a composer, an artist, and a programmer. And the artist they brought in, obviously, was Akira Toriyama, who was best known for manga at the time, manga and books. So he was like, I need a manga artist. And he didn't want someone who looked cartoony, because then they would look like a knockoff of Dragon Quest. He didn't want someone who, who kind of was in the same wheelhouse as Toriyama, who did, like, cutesy stuff, because he didn't want to feel like, you know, a budget knockoff of Dragon Quest. So he went the other direction, and he said, we're going to be more realistic, and we're going to prioritize. It was just, like... A graphical showpiece and the only reason that happened is because he wanted to copy the Dragon Quest formula but instead of bringing on another cutesy comic book guy they went for Amano because Amano was known as the dark serious noir baroque comic guy at the time so yeah that's that's the whole reason he got hired is because they were specifically looking for an anti Akira Toriyama um, but yeah the entire thing was was designed to rip off the success of Dragon Quest without ripping off Dragon Quest.
There's some really beautiful Amano work for games he didn't work on, like FF7. There's some really beautiful stuff of like Cloud and Red 13 and Sephiroth and shit, but they were all post-production images. They weren't part of the concept art. Yeah, unfortunately because of how Japan works, if you're with a company for a long time and you get seniority and you're given projects, like their culture really emphasizes politeness and seniority. So like if someone like Tetsuya Nomura who's been at the company for 30 years has an idea and it's a bad idea, it's considered like a social faux pas to say that's a bad idea. Like you kind of can't, you just kind of have to listen to him because it's like a respect thing. So, like, a lot of the weird shit that started happening in later games, arguably with the Final Fantasy VII Remake as well, I don't know how much of it's Katase and how much is Nomura, um, he has these wild ideas that are super convoluted and, like, people just can't say no because he's, like, the senior guy there. He's, like, the elder statesman of the company now. So, like, there's, there's really no pushback on shit. But, um... You know, it's like a broken clock thing. It's like some of them work, some of them don't. A lot of them are way too confusing. Some of them end up working out really, really well. It's um, it's weird. It's very, very weird. But yeah, anything with multiverses and changing your fate and you know the power of pure hearts and like all this, all this convoluted stuff that was very post Sakaguchi tends to be from Nomura, but not all of it. Any hidden gem games or movies that I've loved the art of recently? I love the pixel art in Sea of Stars. I wouldn't call it a hidden gem though. That game sold like crazy. Um, what else? I mean, Dragon's Dogma is not a hidden gem, but the art direction in that's my favorite art direction in anything in a very long time. Hidden gems. I haven't had time to play much. I've been super busy. I haven't had time to play a lot of stuff, so I haven't seen a lot of hidden gems. Um, I played a Vanillaware game not too long ago that never came here called like Grand Knights Century or something. It, it, you'll find that if you look it up, it's like a turn-based RPG Vanillaware did with like a ton of enemy designs and cool character art and like... You know, it's very, very anime chibi, like Vanillaware stuff, but the enemy designs were super cool because their, their whole thing is basically making moving paintings. And um, some of like the dragons and shit were super cool. I think it was called a like, Grand Knight Century or Holy Knight Century or something. Um, but yeah, that never came out here. So I guess that would be a hidden gem, maybe. Yeah, I haven't had time to play any weird shit lately, which is a shame. I'd love to find something new. I've been going back to a lot of, um, just looking at a lot of the stuff that was formative to me as a kid to try and figure out like what I want to do with new stuff now that I'm like back to full-time painting. I did revisit Shining Force 1 and 2, and I think the enemy and character designs in Shining Force are some of the best like ever. There's so many cool ideas in that game that never really got reused by anything. It's kind of shocking, really, when you go back and look at it, like how good some of it is for a franchise that effectively died. Um, I thought those were really cool. If you've never played it, that's kind of a hidden gem RPG. It's uh, The stories vary by the numbers, but the, the aesthetics, the aesthetics and the music are like incredibly unique. I rewatched a uh, a very Dark Souls movie, short film that was discovered a few years ago. So there was a director, uh, 
I think it was Borman who did the Excalibur movie in the 80s. Very operatic, very dark. There was a lost film that inspired him. Either he made it or it inspired him. I can't remember if he filmed it or if he saw it. But it was considered lost media for years. It was supposed to be this beautiful, beautiful like piece about a knight coming back after the Black Plague and encountering death and like like the character death and like it was called uh, I think it's called Black Angel I think is the name of it um, you can find it someone found a reel of it and restored it a few years ago after like 30 years of thinking it was lost media and um, I rewatched that the other night just because I remembered it existed and that's like probably the most Dark Souls thing ever to exist like a lot of Dark Souls was based on you know classic 80s dark fantasy there's like you know, 50% of Dark Souls is Willow and Excalibur and Dragon Slayer. And, like, there's a ton of aesthetics pulled from those things. But this movie um, has the feeling of, like, a Dark Souls game. It's very, like, steeped in mystery and dread. And, yeah. It is on YouTube. Yeah. It's, a, it's not a commercial thing because they considered it lost media. I don't even know if the copyright is still on it, honestly. Um, cause you know, if he thought it was gone forever, he probably didn't renew it, but yeah. The death knight at the end of it is an amazing design, just an incredible design. Yeah, if I post a link, people can maybe see it. Maybe. Perhaps. I don't know. send it to me because I can't get on Instagram on this computer. I think it's called Black Angel. I think Dark Angel was like a 90s femme fatale show. But I think it's called Black Angel. It feels like a J.W. Waterhouse painting. The whole thing feels like a Waterhouse painting. Like, you know, the girl in white with the long flowing blonde hair who's almost glowing and effervescent and the, the dark stoic knight figure and like, it's great. But yeah. time for much else unfortunately
they do, it's gonna curl up. I can't see the links you're sending me. Actually, you know what I can do? Hold on. Hold on. You've earned it, buddy. You've been promoted to moderator, Dead Man's Pixels. Now post in chat with your link and see if it shows up. You are now the first moderator of my YouTube channel. I think that means you can post links. It'd be kind of dumb if you're a moderator who can't post links. But let's see. Hey, there you go. It showed up for me. It showed up for everybody else. You've done it. You've done it. Out of sheer necessity to view links. pixels with great power comes great responsibility or as Madam Webb says if you take on great responsibility great power will come with it Wow what a better way to say that. You can also block people. I give you managing permissions as a moderator. So if people are spamming or being inappropriate, you can feel like a big powerful man and crack down on them.
There you go. It's cool that they were like, you know what would make Spider-Man cooler? Is if there were tons of spider people 18 years before he was Spider-Man. So he had something to look at and go, I'll just do that. Let's make him unoriginal. Depends. How much money is he going to make? You drop shipping? I'll never forget in college to keep ourselves sane. Sometimes we would do themed work nights where it's like, we're gonna work for 12 hours tonight. We're gonna watch all three Lord of the Rings movies. And then like over time, when I would do open studios like that, people would start bringing themed stuff like, like foods that were from the movies and things uh, just as like to be fun and not go crazy because we were working ourselves to death. And uh, we watched all of Samurai Champloo once over the course of like three days during finals. And uh, there's an episode of Samurai Champloo where the joke is that there's a hundred dumplings. And I think three of them within like a 10 mile radius. You got arrested? I didn't know the Samurai Shampoo writer got arrested. He's not the same guy that did, um, fucking, um, you know, Samurai X, fucking, uh, Rurouni Kenshin, right? I know that guy got arrested for some yikesy stuff, but... Oh, 
Okay. It's all good, man. It's all samurais. Easy, easy mistake. What a weird thing. So here's my recollection of the story. I, I didn't pay super close attention to it. I mostly read headlines. I think I saw Bunzai Pop's video on it. So if I get this wrong, if I tell the story wrong, I apologize. But here's what I remember being the case. Chat can correct me if I'm wrong. Or go watch Bunzai Pop's video on it. Um, the creator of Roroni Kenshin slash Samurai X. Uh, okay, let me start at the beginning. I want to say up till 1980, I think up till 1985, maybe even later, maybe even 1990, it was perfectly legal in Japan to have pornography of girls as young as like 14, possibly even younger. Um, I can't remember what the cutoff was, it might have been even younger, it might have been like 12 or something. It was, it was culturally accepted and was a thing. It was just something the country was okay with. They sold it in stores. You could get it. It was a thing. The creator of Roroni Kenshin and um, Samurai X was a porn enjoyer of that particular kind of what we would here call CP. And they passed a retroactive law, I believe in the 90s. It might have been sooner, I can't remember. They passed a retroactive law that said, um, I believe, this is where I might be getting the story wrong. I believe they said that if you bought that stuff when it was legal, you can hold on to it, but you can't resell it or redistribute it, I think was the law. They were like, hey, if you have this and you've had it, you can keep it, but you can't go looking for new stuff and you can't sell the stuff you have i might that part of the story i might be incorrect on so feel free to check me on that and i believe he was caught buying new stuff or trading i i think that's what happened but i might be wrong so basically he had a fetish that was culturally accepted most of his life and then they said, actually, this is pretty fucked up. We don't want to sponsor this anymore as a state. They phased it out. And he was like, well, it's what I'm into. And he kept pursuing it. And uh, I believe he got, got yikesed into a short prison sentence and a hefty fine. But I could be wrong. Again, please look it up on your own. Um, be careful what you search for when you look it up so you don't end up on a watch list. But, uh, yeah, I don't want to get it too incorrect, so feel free to check me on any of the facts if I got them wrong. But I believe that's what happened. He was a fan of the underage girls, because in Japan, at the time, they weren't considered underage. They were just considered girls, which to us as a Western society is pretty fucking yikes. And, uh, yeah. Well, he's out and writing again because in Japan, he, he did his thing. He served his time and paid his fine. So he's, you know, they don't have the um, cancel culture kind of thing we have here. Like, if you fuck up there and you pay your penance, you paid your penance. So, like, I don't, you know, he might carry some stigma. He definitely does in the West. But I think over there, it's just like, okay. People might not be cool knowing he's into that stuff. And people might, you know, but culturally they're not gonna like say he can't publish stuff they don't that's not something they do over there the way we do it in the west so 
So yeah, he's back writing again. Whether or not you agree with that, listening to this, that is just the case. I think even for drugs, I think, I could be wrong, but I think if you do your time and you pay your fee, I think you're allowed to have a regular life again. People might not like you on a personal level, but I don't think it can prevent you from like having work if you've already paid your penance. Yes, we are, amen, brother. I hope I didn't get any of that story wrong, but uh, I might have. No, not Samurai Shampoo. Samurai X. Roni Kenshin. Not Samurai Shampoo. It is kind of a weird thing. Like, obviously, I disagree with all of it, but... It's weird that it was legal for, and then they, it, it's, that's a, such a strange thing. Like it's legal one year and then the next year it's like, okay, you're fucked now. Like, I think that part of the story is a little strange, but yeah, obviously it never should have been legal in the first place, but clearly they didn't feel the same way, but I think when the story broke, the only reason it's weird for me is that everybody went after that guy like he was doing something irregular and like people were missing the fact that it was like an industry in Japan for like decades. Like tons of people did it and it was like okay. Um, but yeah, obviously it never should have been a thing in the first place. Attacking him as some unique kind of awful seems a bit weird. You should be critiquing the fact that the fucking state allowed it for decades.
But are you puzzled by that, Chase? If you can make, if you like drawing erotica and you can make money doing it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a big market. directed the notebook and then you did 50 shades of gray and you had way more fun doing 50 shades of gray and it fulfilled you creatively then you should do 50 shades of gray like what people deem to be a masterpiece is up to society like when he was making ghost in the shell he wasn't sitting there like this is a masterpiece like people decided it was a masterpiece after it came out because it was done so well that doesn't mean he enjoyed it you know what i mean You can be famous for doing something really well that you didn't enjoy doing, or that you don't enjoy as much as other things you do. That's similar to, uh, if anyone's been following Dave's work for a long time, there was a really funny thing that happened where, um, when Dave did his Ninja Turtle portraits, he got a huge following from the Grimdark reboot crowd back when that was huge. And then, you know, eventually Dave got tired of doing Grimdark portraits and he, he switched to, you know, his Starville thing and doing anime. And um, tons of people would comment all the time being like, why are you doing this? This sucks. Do more of your realistic artwork. I didn't follow you to see fucking cartoons. Like, he got so much pushback when he switched over to anime because people were like, you did that one thing I liked that was really good. So now you can only do that forever. And um, that happens to a lot of creators. It happens to tons of people where like you get big for one thing. So then people only want you to do that one thing. And that, you know, creatively might be something you're not interested in doing at all, if not doing forever. But yeah. If he has more fun, you know, the creator goes in the shell. If he has more fun drawing hentai, then more power to him. He's probably really good at it. The most successful freelancer I know is Sakimi Chan. I don't know her personally, I've only met her once, but she just draws erotica. Erotica is probably not the right word. She draws lewds and nudes of pop culture characters. And you know, clearly she just enjoys drawing the female form. She just likes it. It's just fun. She likes rendering naked female bodies. And like she turned that into a multi million dollar empire of fan art. Like, yeah.
Um, I know the only the only documentary I've seen on the weird pedo culture in Japan was by um, Bunzai Pop, the YouTube channel. Ano might have done one. I, I haven't seen it though. There's a very long breakdown of, of why Japan is the way it is socially and with sexual taboos and cultural taboos on Banzai Pop's channel that goes back like hundreds of years up to the modern day, which is pretty thorough, but a lot of people wrote it off as like pedophilia apologia because like it was trying to explain the situation of what happened with fucking, you know, uh, Peroni Kenshin. So if you're if you're triggered by stuff like that, which is perfectly legit, like it's a very rough topic, then I would not suggest watching it, but yeah. It definitely was a thing that was legal for a very long time. I mean, Sakimi-chan, I would consider Sakimi-chan a freelancer because she's not working for any one company. She's doing her own stuff. I mean, unless we reclassify freelancer to mean that you have to be working for companies. I, you know, she, you could call her a sole proprietor, I guess, or call it Sakimi-chan LLC, or I don't know. She makes her money selling directly to clients, and she's not working for any com one company, you know? It's a type of freelance, I think, but it's also not because you're, I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird. I wouldn't call her a fine artist, so I don't know what to call it. of freelancer being freelancer is that you're free to do what you want. But I guess most freelancers do work for companies and have work published. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'd call her. Maybe a sole proprietor? I don't know. I'm fine with calling her a freelancer, but I understand why that might not seem totally accurate. Before art, freelance typically applied to writing and journalism. And if you were a freelance journalist, what you would do is pursue a story you were into, write the article, and then sell it to the highest bidder to publish in their magazine. So you were just pursuing the stuff, or in this example, creating the art you wanted to create, and then selling it to whoever wanted to buy it. The only difference with Tsukimi-chan is there's no publisher, it's just direct to her audience. She's not going through a company, she's just giving it to people. But it's the same basic premise of being a freelancer. You're not commissioned to, to, to do something. You just decide to do it. People aren't coming to Sakimi-chan. Well, I guess they kind of are on Patreon, but you know what I mean. People aren't coming to Sakimi-chan saying, Hi, I'm going to commission you. I want to see Elsa's, Elsa's pussy. Have her leaning back with her legs spread. I want to see that little snowman guy in the back to make me chuckle, but big emphasis on her pussy. Maybe have an icicle coming out of it. I don't know. Like, no one's doing that. Um, maybe they are. Maybe she offers those services too. I never looked into it. But, uh, yeah. She's just deciding what she likes to do and then finding an audience after the fact. back chat. I could use the restroom.
She should be proud. She's a crazy success. No shame on Sakimi Chin. Yo, 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 yo. I'm back. Listen, I'm going to be very honest with you. When I hear people criticize Sakimi Chan as somehow lesser than, all I hear is people saying, I'm not brave enough <laughs> to do what she does. I'm not willing to throw away my social circles and have the stigma of being an anime porn artist. There's an, if, if you enjoy doing that and there's an audience, fucking capitalize on it. She's super successful. You can't say she's not good at it. She's great at it. You can find painters who do anatomy better or coloring better, or sure, but then why aren't they as big as her? Clearly, there's a secret sauce Sakimi-chan has in the mix that made her what she is. Like, no hate. Don't hate on Sakimi-chan. If you think Sakimi-chan stuff isn't great, go do it better. And if you don't want to do it better, then why do you care? I think most of the hate for her is just cope. I think it's people going, I'm busting my ass to be an artist who's taken seriously. And this person's over here doing an art form that most people consider lesser than because it's pornography. And people are mad that she's making the kind of money they wish they were making on something they consider cheating. They think it's a shortcut or a weird loophole or something that has a stigma attached to it. I don't draw porn, I'm a real artist. Like it's, okay, well. <laughs> there's a reason it's successful. If you don't wanna do it, that's perfectly fine. If you wanna do art that's taken more seriously on a cultural level, that's also perfectly fine. But that doesn't give you carte blanche to criticize your stuff just because she's successful at it. Having grown up in a very, 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 very uh, prudish environment, I will say, 
I think it's kind of dope that pornography isn't as stigmatized nowadays, but that's just me. If you think her marketing and her business skills are greater than her art skills, I would probably agree with you. But if you're a freelancer, marketing and business are just as important as the art. So if you're looking at the whole artist and not just the portfolio, she's doing a lot really well. Because remember, if you're an artist trying to make money, you got to be a business person. That's just as important. It's like that Neil Gaiman freelance thing we talked about the other day, the, the circle within the circle. Being good at the art is only one third of it. You also have to be, you know, quick and reliable. And you also have to be someone people enjoy. Those are the other two parts. So, yeah, I would agree. I think her marketing and stuff is probably better than the fundamental quality of her work. But those things are huge. Don't undersell those. Those are massive. Remember, art's an average. If your art is a four, but your business management skills are a 10 and a 10, you know, you're still gonna, I'm so bad at math. That would be 24 divided by three. Jesus Christ, you'd still be like an eight. It would carry you up, is what I'm saying. Like look at somebody like Micah Ulrich. Michael Ulrich's art isn't technically super insane. He's not doing crazy hyper-rendered stuff. His stuff is super simple. He copy-pastes a lot of his work into his new work. It's very repetitive. But hot damn, has he cornered a massive market and is, you know, fucking rolling in cash as a result. Like, the quality of the work, the objective quality of the work or subjective quality of the work, either one, is only one piece of a three-piece puzzle. And too many people ignore the other pieces. You can be a very mid-artist with great skills, marketing, and be a huge success. Likewise, you can be a huge success who's a complete asshole with no business acumen, and you can be poor. You know, it's like, I know people like that. I know very successful, technically skilled painters who should be multimillionaires that can barely afford their rent because people hate working with them and they don't know anything about how to market themselves. I think Sashimi Chan's a pretty good painter, personally, but I do agree that her business skills are the most important part of her formula. There's plenty of anime hentai artists on DeviantArt who wish they could be her, and that's not because of the quality of the work, that's because of her business mind, so I will agree with that. Shays, who's your favorite hentai artist? Let me put it that way. Give us a better hentai artist in chat to go look at. <laughs> it's such a funny thing to ask somebody. Well, if you don't like Sakimi chans and nudes and lewds of pop culture figures, who's, whose do you like? What's your standard for naked fan art? You sound like a purist. So I'm really interested in your opinion on this. You sound like you got a lot of experience looking at this genre. So please, tell me. Who's painting the best anime pussy out there? We need your expertise, Chase.
What do I want to listen to? Um, let's try this. Hey, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Oh. I think you were probably correct, Eric. Man, finding the right music is fucking difficult today. Difficult today, guys. Nintendo 64 drum and bass liquid funk mix. Jump up neuro funk dark side. All right, let's try that. I'll never forget, I stayed at a friend's house once when I was like 13, and I fell asleep watching Sci-Fi Channel because um, I think Vampire Hunter D was on, the 80s one, the original. I fell asleep and I woke up to my friend's mother coming home from her job the night shift at like, 4 a.m. or something, 3 a.m., I can't remember. At some point, after Vampire Hunter D was on, I guess Wicked City came on, if anyone's ever seen that. There's there's some, like, crazy nudity monster shit in that movie. And I woke up to her screaming, What are you doing? And I jumped up off the couch, and I was like, What? What, what the hell's going on? I guess she must have thought I was just watching, like, well, I guess at that point she must have thought I was, like, buying porn or something. It was Sci-Fi Channel. It had to be censored. Like, I don't even remember what scene it was. I just remember her losing her fucking mind over it. And I was like, holy shit. So now every time I see the Wicked City cover, I get like a little triggered. I get like a little heart palpitation. I remember her screaming at me. And I was like, I was just watching Vampire Hunter D. Which, don't get me wrong, also has tits, but not like this. It's a snake woman with tits. Technically, it's six pairs of tits, but they don't render the nipple fully, so it, it, come on. I remember telling her. I remember fighting for my life. I was like, it's sci-fi channel. They don't show porn on Sci-Fi Channel! I remember pointing at the- Look, look! Because it had the little planet, the little Saturn in the corner, the watermark. So like, look, it's Sci-Fi Channel! It's not porn, it's Sci-Fi Channel! Uh, it's great. Great moment to be alive. one of those things where I could have saved myself by throwing my friend under the bus and saying if I wanted to watch porn there's a bunch under his bed didn't you know that but I didn't I kept my mouth shut I didn't sell my friend out I didn't tell his mom about the stack the absolute stack of hometown hottie hustlers under his bed 
I didn't do it. I took my punishment in silence. Shout out to the girl I grew up next to my entire life because we were seated in alphabetical order who ended up doing hometown hotties. Shout out to you. It was interesting seeing your entire body after sitting next to you for 17 years. You know who you are. The funniest thing about that, she was a waitress at like a diner here. Like she might still be, she might still be a waitress at a diner here. And like, she went and did that magazine and like, I thought it was fake. I thought people were just making it up cause like, that's like a rare thing for someone you know to do. It wasn't fake, it was real. But then she just went back to her diner job and like, People would just come in and be huge fucking creeps like all the time and she had to like pretend to be into it. Maybe she was into it. Maybe she's one of those people that actually liked it. I don't know. But yeah, that was super funny to me. Cause like you'd go in there for breakfast and you'd see people come in and they would just do that thing where they're like, like looking at her a little too much. And I'm like, you're here just to see the girl that was in the porn mag. Like, what is this? told me she did it to boost her confidence and she does not regret it and I said you know what girl whose name I won't say out loud on the internet I respect it I said I don't have the bravery to do that Godspeed What's this piece of imagery for? This is an Elden Ring piece that's going to be released through Meatbun.com. Meatbun.com for all your niche gaming clothing and attire. Yeah. Yeah. We're just finishing out the details. Oh yeah, no, it's confusing. I understand. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Half the process of how I work right now is making things too complicated and over-rendering it, then selectively knocking back areas until it looks done. 
So right now I'm in the overdoing it phase, and then I'll throttle it back and reduce the detail and add overlays for emphasis and blur and smudging until it looks done. Right now I'm just building up the textures mostly. Once all the areas look the equal amount of done, I can emphasize the areas I want to focus on. But because this is going to get printed poster size, it's very important to me that the rendering is fairly uniform. I don't want anything to be unfinished. Because when it's poster size, you can really see those things. The first few I did, I went under the assumption it was going to be like, you know, typically illustrations printed fairly small, like on a card or on a screen at the maximum size. When I did the first couple posters I did for Meepun and they printed, don't get me wrong, the posters look good, but the areas that weren't done to my standard or done as much as the other areas stood out to me. And I was like, okay, going forward, I have to really emphasize that I want the whole piece to be done. Because when you blow it up to 24 by 36, that stuff jumps out way more than it does on a monitor or on a card. You can get away with implying a lot on a card. It's printed so small that the impressionism helps things blend together and you can get away with it, but not so much on a poster. Thanks, Victor. get paid for this I think you said you get a percentage yeah so the way the payment breaks down for this this is essentially the same rate as a magic card it's a couple thousand and then on the back end um, when it's posters I can sell the posters directly and keep a hundred percent of the poster sales so depending how much I promote it and how many like places I put it to sell it I could make I don't know ten grand off it if I really pushed it probably but these are going to be gilded posters with gold leaf, so they're probably going to be like closer to 100, maybe 75. I don't know what it's going to cost with the gold. So however many of those I sell, you know, if I sell 100 limited edition prints times 75, that's like 7,500 plus the uh, upfront money. So yeah, if I said this is a limited print, there's only 100 of these and I sell out, I'd make around 10,000. much I make off it really comes down to how much I want to push it. But minimum, minimum a couple thousand. But I also got basic total creative freedom on this one. This one's like all me. The other two I work with my AD um, on a lot of it, but this one was pretty much entirely me. Hey buddy, if you're willing to pay the shipping, I will send anything to Ireland. I'll bring it with you. I mean, I'll bring it with me when I come to see you and we go to the ruins of Tir Nanag and kiss the Blarney Stone or whatever the fuck you guys do. Listen, I'm joking, okay? I wrote an entire treatment for a massive graphic novel that starts in Ireland, okay? Listen, I love Ireland. I love it. 
I make fun of it because I can't be there. I want to be there. I want to live there. I want to live there for two to three years and do my graphic novel about it there and soak it all in. But I can't. So instead I pretend I hate you and I say things like Guinness and Blarney Stone because if I can't have you I sure as hell can hurt you. <laughs> Sorry. Well, the sketch, you're in luck. I have the sketch. I'll show you the sketch. The answer is like a month or two. But there we go. There's the sketch. There it is. Should have just sold that. Should have just fucking, you know? There it is. Should have just put that on the shirt. Should have done it. The sketch was better, I agree. 100%. I'd rather wear a t-shirt with the sketch on it. Yeah, I have a couple Final Fantasy things um, in the works. I can't show you the thing we're doing for 16 because that's going to be through Square Enix, so it's NDA. Until I get permission from Square, I can't show that on stream. But there is a big Final Fantasy 16 piece that I have been working on. But um, they put a pause on it because they wanted me to work on some other stuff. And um, yeah, hopefully, I'm, a, I'm hoping that'll be out in time for the one year anniversary in July, but I don't know. I have another piece for The Witcher that I did that's also in this style for The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt that hasn't come out yet. Yeah, I do very... I, I, I really enjoy straight, iconic stuff. I like iconic compositions. I like doing things that feel like they could exist in the world.
Oh boy, my favorite. Painting viscera. My Genova thing is also for Final Fantasy, actually. It's just a different thing than this. We basically finished this. There's a couple little tiny things to clean, but this is basically done. I gotta do the nameplate on the head and a couple other little tiny things. Probably got one more day of work on this. But yeah, we did this on stream the last couple weeks, and this is also for Final Fantasy. Oh, the color blindness fixing glasses? Yeah, they, they, they fixed the color blindness, but it comes at a trade-off because the only way to correct the way you see color is to put um, colors that tint the color in the correct direction in front of you. So you're sacrificing your color for a value. So you can see the colors more, more accurately, not perfectly, but much more accurately, but they're basically like wearing sunglasses because they're so heavily tinted to correct the color. So, yeah, you're seeing it correctly, but everything's darker. So it's it, it's weird. I wouldn't use them for painting because it would fuck up all my values. Um, but yeah, they, they do work. It's just for painting, they're kind of a, I don't know what to call it. It's like a wash, basically. It's like, yeah, your colors are better, but now everything's too dark. I don't think there's a way to do it um, without sacrificing uh, value because to tint glass, it inherently makes the glass darker. There's no way to tint glass without tinting it. So I don't, I don't know if there's a way to make glasses that, that fix the color and also compensate the value. I don't think it's something you can do. But who knows, maybe they'll find something.
what they should do is what they do for video games in Photoshop. Maybe they already do. Maybe it already exists. There should just be a color blindness mode. Filters in Photoshop. How to, like, what filters to put on my work to correct the colors. Do, like, color balance and, like, level adjustment layers and saturation layers and things. And after a while, I had a pretty consistent set of filters I could throw on top of my work to make it look as intended. Um, that was pretty fun to figure out. That helped for, for a while when I was doing my early published stuff that was full color. I don't know if you can get a monitor. If you get a monitor with it built into the glass, it would be the same problem. You'd have to have something where the lights change the colors they show internally. If the glass is tinted though, it's always going to be too dark by nature. It's already there, that's cool. I'm actually curious. I'm actually very curious now. View, proof setup. Oh! Interesting. something else That's interesting because it looks exactly the same to me. Can you guys un can you guys see the difference? That one I can see, but that's not my color blindness, so that makes sense. Interesting. I don't see any difference between the CMYK and the Deutera typical whatever the fuck. So I'm going to switch it to Deuteranopia. I don't see any difference between that and CMYK. Damn. Wow. I guess I wouldn't though, that's the whole point. Okay. All right, if I zoom way in, I can see The RGB is a bit more saturated, like the warmth. I can see a difference in the warmth, a very subtle difference in the warmth. Interesting. Interesting. So how do I use the proof? Would I paint using the proof and then switch back to RGB when I'm done painting and it would compensate? Is that how you would do it? So I would paint my image in colorblind mode and then I would switch it to RGB and it would fix it, right? That would be the way to use it? too bad okay that makes sense so okay hmm. 
So chat, what you're seeing here, this is how I see it. Okay. Yeah, there's not really a, it's not really an effective way to use this to fix work then. Uh, it's still interesting though. Dr. Mario. Had a rough couple days. My uh, my nephew got the eye surgery to fix his blindness, and the anesthesiologist fucked up. So when he woke up on the way home, he just he had too much pressure behind his eye because they fucked up what they gave him, and um, he just couldn't stop vomiting for hours. And we we kept calling to figure out how the hell what to do, and they were like, eh, it'll it'll pass, and like like eight hours, like 5 p.m. to like three in the morning. He just couldn't stop vomiting and like freaking out because he's like a, he's like six. He doesn't understand what the hell's going on. He just knows that someone cut open his eye and he has to wear an eye patch and he can't stop throwing up. So it's been, it's been a long couple days. A little tired, but. He's better now. He doesn't understand why he has to wear the eye patch. It's annoying him, but I mean, it annoyed me too when I had to wear one when I was a kid. I'm probably gonna get mine when I go home for Easter tomorrow. I'm probably gonna go see if my old eye patch is still in my mom's things. She keeps all that kind of stuff for sentimental value. Probably gonna see if my old eye patch is still there, and if it is, I'll probably put it on just to be in solidarity with him. At least he'll think that's funny. You know, it'll make it less weird if two of us are doing it. I mean, I have a way to fix my color work that me and Dave figured out years ago that's pretty reliable. It's a series of adjustment layers I put on top of the, my paintings to make it printable for people that, you know, want to see it normally. I can just do that. I'm not super worried about it. That's the issue I had, Jeff. 
Whenever I would do portraits in college, uh, my professors would yell at me because the mod the skin tones on the models were always skewing green, and I couldn't I couldn't see them. So I never told anyone there I was colorblind because I didn't want them to treat me weird. So I would just have to bullshit excuses for why it happened. I'd have to say like it was a choice I made or something. The most successful bullshit excuse I made for it was, um, you know, talking about the fluorescent lighting the school had installed and how the lights weren't conducive to proper artwork creation and all this bullshit. And it was, yeah, it was all just cope. Cope and trolling. How could her skin not look green under these fluorescent lights you've installed? I understand saving money, but at what cost? I can barely see the real her beneath this trash lighting. Cope, 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 cope. Cope, 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 cope. One of them was an ego lie, where I pretended to be a pretentious artist. Where I was like, I always put a little green on my palette. That way people know it's a Dan Warren. Troll, troll, troll. Cope, 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 cope. At the end of this class, we're going to hang up 20 portraits of the same woman. I don't want to be just another one of those 20 portraits. I want you to see mine. See the green I put there that doesn't belong there and go, huh, why did they do that? Suddenly I'm not just another portrait on a wall. I am Dan Warren, user of green. <laughs> the amount of bullshit troll stuff to tell professors in art school became like an art form. Because when you said something deep like that, they wouldn't laugh at you the way that we laugh at stuff like that. They'd be like, oh, ooh, oh. Oh, oh, so serious. Oh. Like, they buy into that bullshit, which makes it extra, extra, extra funny. Let's go. I'm in with, like, life-size drawings of, like, brains, or, like, life-size drawings of garbage, or just, like, random expressive lines that were life-size, and, like, all this stuff. And then I put mine up. They did it alphabetically, so I was basically last. And mine was just a realistic pencil drawing, life-size, of me dressed as Conan the Barbarian, but without muscles. So it's just my fat, naked body holding a broadsword between my legs like a huge penis with a skull on my shoulder. And I was like, this is how I see myself. And I had to try and not crack through the whole presentation. I had to be like, I see myself as a warrior, fighting on the art artistic battlefields, you know? I really see myself as a conqueror, you know? I want to go out there and I want... <laughs> it was just... Oh, it was great. It's good. That's true. The true art is not bursting out laughing. Absolutely. Truer words have never been said. That's the real test. Yeah, one girl left the canvas blank. Yeah, that was the best one. That's how she sees herself, as nothing. I was like, if art school was graded on bullshit, you would have gotten an A+. Your bullshitting skills, A+. One girl did a self-portrait with a giant skeleton behind her because she said death's always chasing her. I laughed at that one. I did laugh at that one. I got yelled at. And I said, I think my exact answer was what? It's fucking sick. It's like, I love it. 
should put a giant skeleton behind you in every portrait. It's fucking awesome. And they were like, no, 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 no. Not serious enough. Here you go, chat. Here's me at my critique, looking very serious. We had to take photos in front of our portraits to show how serious we were. Art v. Artist, chat. Art v. Artist. Wow. Look how thoughtful I am. I'm so thoughtful about being a big naked fat guy on a wall in a room full of serious people. Well done. Sandman. I was actually even lamer. I was even lamer than that. I listened to Radiohead and read, <laughs> read poetry. Ugh. Ew. Get out of here. Listen to Radiohead and read Jeff Tweedy lyrics? Get the fuck out of here. Go home. Grow up. when you realize there's a direct correlation between the music you listen to and how you feel. 
like when you stop listening to sad shit, even if you think it's beautiful, when you stop listening to sad shit all the time, you stop being sad shit all the time. It's like an audio diet. It's kind of weird. Gotta find a. There isn't a really good picture of it. I'm just gonna have to kind of wing it on this. That's okay though. One of my good friends, who I went to school with, this is kind of dark. It's kind of dark. One of my good friends I went to school with shared on social media the other day that one of our professors uh, basically groomed her and tried to essay her. And um, I think I know who it was. And it's basically taking all my strength not to go back to the school and audit one of their classes and just walk up to them after and be like, I know what you did. <laughs> like, it, I'm so mad about it because I think I know who it was. And the fact that that was happening the whole time and just nobody fucking knew is like, I don't know, makes me madder than almost anything in the fucking world. Oh my god, you used a word I don't know, and now I wonder if there's a reference for it, because you used a word I didn't know how to search for. Gastrostiges? Oh my god. Gastrostiges snake. Oh my god. Hell yeah. Thank you, Truitt. <laughs> That's a good word.
Oh, thank you. I'm glad you like those. You're talking about these, yeah? Thank you. Yeah, I wanted them to feel very, very kid spooky. I'll finish this soon. There's just some more detailing I want to do and like the, I gotta, yeah, I went through the stuff I want to finish on these, but these were really fun. Making the dagger look like a little rooster face on the open beak where it's like with the tongue, the bottom beak down here, top beak up here. That was fun. Yeah, all the little stuff in this was the fun part. Like the, the wolf head and the staff throwing up the fireball. All the little things. All the honeybees on this guy's armor. Bears and honey. Yeah. I'll finish it soon. One of these days, I'll get around to it. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. It's a really fun piece. This one's my favorite, the Wolf Pope. They're really happy with how he came out. I wanted it to look like when you have an old book and you open up the cover and there's like the end sheet before the book starts with like a pressed illustration. I wanted it to feel like that. End sheets. Glad you like it. Yeah, if you can find the book, I'd love to see it. Add it to my collection, maybe. Always love finding old books. This one has to go. This one has to go. This is not accurate. This hand, I don't know what I was thinking when I painted that there. That is not the right size. At all. That's gotta go.
I don't know what this song is, but I fucking love that. Oh, ow, 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 ow. I love that. Supposedly, this is all N64 music. Supposedly. Oh, it's from the new Tetris? Oh, that's very funny. I would not have guessed that. should finish your guts piece. I should finish my god hand piece that no one's ever seen. But will I? Probably not. But you should finish your guts piece. It's not even on this computer. I'd have to port it over from my old computer. Sacrifice. I can't remember off the top of my head what the brand of sacrifice looks like. But did I get that? Hold on. I gotta look this up now. To remember what I fucking did with this piece. It's been a while. There we go. Okay. I had it upside down. My bad. the brand of sacrifice my pieces okay with this thing except this shape up here gets turned into voids cowl and voids in here and his hands down here holding the brand centered inside the brand and it's lit upwards and then this down in here becomes his bat wing cloak thing wrapping around each other like that 
and then there's some some design stuff on the sides with the other god hand members but yeah it's void with his wings wrapped around each other down here and it's, yeah it's a whole thing maybe it'll get done someday I don't know if I've ever shown up the god hand thing. Maybe. It's getting hard for me to break out of my pattern of paint paintings where it's just person staring forwards with an iconic design around them, kind of pigeonholing myself, but goddamn, do I love iconic designs of people staring forwards. This needs to come up. having a good time. 
He's like, hey. Contributing to the ever-growing mass of their master. Supposedly this character, I saw it in a video breakdown of visual references in Elden Ring. This is based on a real, like, Celtic snake god from some country. I don't know if it's in, like, Ireland or Finland or something. There's a statue of a snake with, like, a man's face pressing out of the center of it, which I'd never seen before. I was like, that's such a cool, such a cool reference to find. find it. Can I find it? Can I find it? It's in a video from somebody called Tarnished Archaeologist. He found it. I know that's where I saw it. But hey, you know, what are you going to do? Direction, actually, I found some good references I can use for this painting. That's pretty sick, Chase. Specifically, the statue I'm thinking of that they reference, it like it like is Rikard. It's like um, if I draw it down here, the statue looks like this from the side. It's like a snake curling backwards with like the snake's face, you know? And then from the front, there's like a human face pressing out of the belly like this. Like it's very much just Rikard. Like they absolutely based it on that. And it's somewhere in Europe. I can't remember where though.
It is Glycon. Let's take a look. I think it's this one, unless there's a different one I'm not seeing. I don't think. Or this isn't the one I saw, at least. Because there's no human face pressing out of the belly. Hmm. Oh no. Eggley, yeah, because they they used the same name and um they used the same name for the snake. Yeah, yeah, they used the same name in Elden Ring. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay, we got there. We got there, chat. There's the statue. It's fucking dope. It's so cool. Pushing out with all the viscera coming around the sides of the face. Yeah, super cool.
Kayfabe? No, I don't know who that is. What happened? I don't know who Kayfabe... Well, maybe I've seen Kayfabe's work, but I... Off the top of my head, I don't know who that is. That is Bomberman music. Being a creep? Oh, what kind of creep? Like a has questionable porn creep, or a stalks women creep, or a essay creep. Like what? There's so many flavors of creep nowadays. Grooming stuff? Oh. That sucks. Is it like actual grooming or is it like the girl was 21 and he was 30 grooming? The window on what people call things has exploded lately so I, I just wanna, yeah. Technically legal? I don't know what that means. Doesn't legal grooming mean one of them has to be underage? I might be wrong. Seventeen, yeah, that's a bit yikes. Did he know she was seventeen? <laughs> That's going to be the court case. I can see it now. Your Honor, I had no way of knowing. Come on. Your Honor, look at her. It's going to be that defense. Yikes! It just keeps getting worse! He asked her her age and still did it. Wow. Wow. So being creepy in chat, bad. Being creepy in chat to a girl who might be too young, double bad. Being creepy to a girl in chat who might be too young that you've asked, are you too young? And she says, yes, I'm too young and still doing it? That's a triple yikes. You don't get a triple yikes often, guys. Triple yikes is pretty pretty open and shut, you know? The plausible deniability is uh, pretty gone at that point. Yikes. Yikes. Well, that's too bad. I'm sorry the show's over for people that enjoyed it, but I can't really blame this partner for separating from him professionally. That's pretty bad. That's pretty blatantly awful. That's like the Justin Roiland stuff where he was like, well, I didn't do anything illegal. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. But you did ask, underage girls did tell you they were underage and your response was, how does it feel to be jailbait? Like, you know, you know, or like, you're going to be so hot when you're this old, like, you know, yeah, maybe what you did isn't illegal in quotations, but like, come on, dude.
Well, he didn't lose everything he had because he said some shit. He lost everything he had, mostly because of the domestic dispute he had with his partner. The optics of that were not great. All the shit he did to the girls after that uh, reinforced it. That all came out after the fact. But then it was ruled that he didn't do anything in the domestic either. So it is kind of weird. But, I mean, if you want my opinion, this is a bit conspiratorial. But... People like conspiracies. Um, if you want my opinion, I think Adult Swim signed to the biggest contract they'd ever signed in their history with Rick and Morty for like 10 seasons, whatever that massive deal was. They signed a huge fucking deal with Rick and Morty. Um, like the, the biggest content deal they ever did. And I think by season four of Rick and Morty, they realized that, uh-oh, this show has a shelf life and we're already hitting it. And I think at the first the first possible moment they had to renegotiate that deal and get better terms, they took it. And I think that that moment was when he got charged with the domestic stuff because his contract probably had a conduct clause and he, that was probably a violation of it. Um, that's my conspiracy brain theory on it, was they had buyer's remorse for Rick and Morty, and they wanted out. And that gave them a really, really clean way to do it. Um, they still own it, but I, I guarantee you they renegotiated what that deal looked like after that. They thought that was going to be the biggest cash cow in the history of Adult Swim, and it fell off real fast. He did do some weird shit, though, so, I mean, there's no deniability like plausible deniability, so, if Adult Swim had an opportunity to say, hey, this is why we canceled it, and it's plausible, they're gonna take it. Domestic stuff turned out to, well, I don't know what true means in this case. It, it, it didn't hold up in court. I don't know if that means it was true or not. It didn't hold up in court. Whether or not something happened, I have no idea. I just know that the charges didn't stick. piece like this? No. Maybe someday. I don't know anything about this cartoonist guy though. I'm just going off what chat's telling me, so I don't really have a take on that.
Wait, hold on. Was the girl legal age or not? I thought the chat said she was 17. If she was 18 plus, then this story is a lot different. Oh, if he told female colleagues he would give them agents contacts in exchange for sexual shit, then that's no. That's no. No. That's true. In certain places, 17 is legal. That is true. If at any point the girl said, I'm not interested or stop, and he kept doing it, that's, uh, that's a big no-no. Listen, guys, I only dated another artist once, okay? And even that just felt weird because it felt like, can you help me out with my career? It's like, where's where's the line? Like, it's, it's just, I don't know. I don't know. I just avoid all that shit. One was, one was enough for me to feel uncomfortable and weird and like, I, I just didn't like the, I don't know. The dynamic is just weird. Because it's like, I don't know, th there's an innocent way to do it that isn't bad, but it's always going to ride some kind of strange line mentally, and it's just not a, not a great feeling. Especially if you're a fan of their work, because it's like you want to help them a ton, and it's, yeah, it just gets messy, guys. Just, just be careful. You can definitely do it. It's just, you know. That's if the relationship survives. If the relationship doesn't survive, feelings can change quick, you know? I typically don't trust selected screenshots personally, mostly because of the Bill Burr joke. If you get a bad read, a playful, no, stop. No, you're so awful, stop it. Can become, no, stop. You're so awful, stop. Like it's like, 
I don't know what the context was. I don't have access to someone's whole chat logs. I don't know what their dynamic was. Like, selected screenshot leaks, I never even read them. Like, you could take stuff me and Dave send to each other. We're not even romantic most of the time. And it's like, out of context, that shit looks fucking unhinged. Later, Miguel. Who would flip between loving your work and a strange, vindictive jealousy? Yeah, I get that. I think that's pretty common. Even with artists who are friends, I think that can happen a lot, let alone lovers. That's the basis of um, Guts and Griffith and Berserk, was Mira and his best friend were both artists, and he was super jealous of the guy's talent. And he created Griffith as an allegory for their friendship. Yeah, she's definitely can happen. I've never been like propositioned for like favors. That's never been a thing. But anytime you mix business and pleasure, things can get weird. So it's just not something I do as a policy anymore. Like I said, I, I you know, dated someone else who, whose work I also liked irrespective of, you know, liking them as a person. And it just, it just feels weird. It just feels weird to me. Some people can handle it, and I envy them. That's super cool that you can do that. But it's like, I don't know. Oh, I'm sure there's a huge difference. I'm sure there's a difference in Far East, Middle East, East. I'm sure, I'm sure every culture has a different relationship with how those things are handled.
I don't think I could ever be comfortable in a relationship with someone if I even remotely thought that they thought my opinion of them was in any way some kind of gatekeeping to future success. Like if they even if they even had the idea that it ever could be, I don't think I could be comfortable in that relationship. Like that's just not I don't know, that makes me super fucking uncomfortable. Because, like, I don't know, you guys watch me stream all the time, and I used to stream way more, and, like, I try to help everybody, irregardless of who they are and what they're doing. But, pain overs, critiques, you know, if people are good for a job, I always recommend them, even if I don't know them super well, but, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's just a, it's a power dynamic, and I it's not you know it's a weird one to negotiate sometimes. I've heard that saying. Yeah, I've heard that. It's different. They're French. Yeah, I've heard that. Fucking wild. That's what I'm doing now, Dead Man's Pixels. I've decided. I've decided to become a monk. We'll see what kind of curveballs life throws me that I've made this decision. There's usually something funny. When I made the decision to start dedicating myself to fitness a couple months ago, the first week I did it, I worked out for like three hours every day. I was feeling great. The end of like the seventh day, I dove into a pool to do my three hours of laps and I blew my eardrum out. And then I couldn't do any lifting or swimming for a month. Because life just loves to... <laughs> life just loves to be life, you know? So we'll see what happens. recovering from an ear infection that I thought was over and it wasn't completely over and when I jumped into the pool the pressure differential of the water against my ear blew my eardrum out. No, it doesn't cause permanent damage if you uh, if you catch it fast and you treat it fast it's not necessarily permanent. It can be permanent if you fuck it up bad enough or if you don't take care of it and see an ear doctor like immediately but I went straight from the pool to the hospital. If you ever blow your eardrum out, get help immediately. Go see a specialist immediately. Because you can fuck your ear up forever if you don't catch it quick. Did I cannonball sideways? No. Why would I ever do that? No. 
I was just doing laps, I just did a standard dive. And it felt like a gunshot in the side of my head. <laughs> yeah, it was great. a stream tomorrow and there might not. It depends on when I get back from Easter and how dead I am. Do I count calories or what's my approach? Um, I count calories and I try to work out one to three hours a day, at least five days a week. So for a person my size to lose the amount of weight I want to lose, originally I was doing 2,600 calories a day. Um, I've been on a weight loss plateau for a little while, so we upped it um, recently to 3,500 to try and break the plateau. Um, because they were worried my body was going into starvation mode. So on a day when I swim, I burn more than I eat, so I'm in a pretty massive deficit. So I typically eat about three pounds of chicken a day and then some rice and some vegetables is typically what I eat. I do ground chicken, ground chicken breast always. It's the lowest fat. And I even make tacos or stir fry or burgers out of it or something. But yeah, that's typically all I did. I lost 60 pounds in three months, 20 pounds a month-ish, almost a pound a day, and then I hit a huge plateau that I've lost another, give or take, 10 pounds in the last couple months on this plateau. It's moving slowly, like it's moving, but it's moving super fucking slow. But um, yeah, that's essentially where I'm at. I'm gonna start introducing um, like heavy lifting. For muscle growth probably next week 
Um, gotta talk to my trainer, but yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping that'll help get the weight loss back on track. I wanted to lose 100 pounds in six months, but the plateau basically made that impossible. I was on track to. I lost 60 and three, but yeah, that's gone now. Now I'm hoping I can lose 100 in a year. How do I approach adding color to a grayscale image like this? It's usually done with um, adjustment layers. I usually do like a tone ground adjustment layer and then I'll start washing in color and then I'll do, you know, stuff to make it darker or lighter accordingly. But yeah, that's typically what it is. It's usually a series of multiplies, overlays, color layers and color burn layers with adjustment sliders. If I want to do an image in like vibrant color, like a full illustration though, I usually just do the image in color. Like I don't um I don't um start with grayscale. Jeez. Let's see. Let's see. Going way back, let's see. Maybe it's not here. Going way back. Yikes. Yikes, chat, yikes.
All right, something's off here. Something's off here. going to show you a piece I did direct color with, but I guess it's gone. Most I ever lost was 120 pounds doing a zero carb diet, but then when I transitioned to a calorie diet, it all came back. Any favorite games that were never released here? Uh, most of the Golden Age SNES RPGs, like the ones you listed, Treasure of the Ruder is for sure. Um, yeah, mo it's mostly going to be that stuff. It's mostly going to be the Square Enix Lost Gems from the, the Super Nintendo. Those games are incredible and beautiful. Um, I would love to play the Dragon's Dogma MMO that we never got here. Um, I would also love to play the Dragon Quest... What is it? Dragon Quest X? Was that the one that was an MMO that was region locked? I would love to play those. No, I was looking for uh, I was looking for a painting where I did direct color that was posted on my old Twitter that got hacked, but um, because it's on my old computer, I don't have the file on this computer where I'd show it to you, but uh, I couldn't find it on my Twitter, so I yeah I didn't want to lose any more painting time, so I just stopped looking. Well, I'm not eating any sugar, so the sugar is extremely minimal. It's not the insulin. Plateaus are weird. I, I don't know. Everyone has conflicting advice, so it gets annoying really fast. Some people say eat even less. Then people say, well, you're going into starvation mode, so you got to eat more. 
Then people say cut carbs completely. Then people say don't cut carbs completely because you're going to trick your body. When you introduce them, you're going to gain a bunch of weight. Some people say, you know, it, it's just, it, it's all, it's all bullshit. <laughs> it just sucks. Plateaus just suck. I'm on a calorie diet of a little under 3,000 right now. And I drink a gallon of water every day. And I try to get eight hours of sleep a night. And I should, after this long of a plateau, I should be losing weight, and I'm not. So I'm wondering if it's some kind of hormonal thing, or if I gotta see a doctor. It shouldn't be possible for me to hold weight um, for the amount of exercise I'm doing and the food I'm eating. So something is, something is wrong, and I don't really know what it is, and it's extremely frustrating. Because dieting takes a lot of effort. When you don't get results, it's extremely, extremely annoying. But I guarantee any obvious thing you're going to type, I've already tried it because it's been almost three months of this plateau and it's uh, very, very annoying. I only had one jump from like a 10 point drop and then some of it was probably water weight because it's fluctuating between, you know, those 10 pounds. But uh, yeah, it's super fucking annoying. say exercise even more and then people say you're not eating enough to do that much exercise your body's gonna give out and then it's just everyone disagrees about everything it's just a bummer there's no like definite answer really mathematically for the amount of exercise I'm doing and what I'm eating though it should be impossible for me to hold on to weight right now I have a net zero calorie intake. Sometimes it's negative a thousand. So like, I don't know, I guess over enough time it's gonna force me to, but I don't know. Starvation mode can only last for so long until your body has to eat itself, <laughs> you know? It's just, uh, it's just a pain in the ass. I could be building muscle, but that feels like fat kid cope. That's like literally like what a fat kid says when people call him fat. It's like, it's just bulk. I'm building muscle, bro. Like, even if it's true, it feels like a cope to say it. No, it's not. See, this is the thing. This is why it's annoying, chat. Gut health, fucking sleep schedule, fucking hormones. All that shit sounds good. I'm telling you mathematically for a person my size to be eating what I'm eating and exercising enough to burn it all off every day, it's impossible. It should be impossible to hold on to weight for as long as I'm holding on to it. So I don't know what I don't know what I'm doing. It's gotta be it's gotta be some kind of hormonal thing. I have no clue. It's not calories in, calories out though. Like, if you lock me in a room and you don't feed me for long enough, I'm going to turn into a skeleton. So I'm just going to have to do that to myself, I guess. And just keep dropping calories until it stops. I think I had 1,000 calories two days ago. And I burned 2,500. And I, it's just like, yeah... I don't know. If I keep doing that long enough, something has to change. I don't have a ton of fats in my diet, Victor. I'm eating like chicken breast and rice and stuff. Like I'm not eating fats really. The only fats I have are the olive oil spray that I cook the meat with. How does cutting caffeine make you lose weight? 
or gain weight. If you're not eating enough calories to gain weight, why would caffeine matter? It's okay, man. It's all good, Chase. I don't drink alcohol. No. I don't eat fruit either. I'm eating... I told you what I'm eating. I'm eating protein and sometimes rice and sometimes vegetables. But mostly protein. I'm drinking black coffee. I'm not having any dairy. I'm uh, other than like hard cheese that I mix in with the meat sometimes. I'm not eating any fruit. I'm not eating any sugar. I'm not drinking any alcohol. skeletons on the inside. It's a stress thing with the caffeine. Okay. You smell like a rocket. Oh boy, chat. I gotta use the restroom and then I'll be back. I'll try to rally. I'm losing my energy here.
Oh, we're back. Whew. My leg is stiff tonight. Oh my goodness. Let's look at this fucking thing. There's like a weird skin flap thing in the model that I think I'm gonna do. It, uh, it's triangular. be about that big. It fills up that spot nicely. It's kind of chunky. You know if you get different just drink carburetors if they're sweets, just have an hour of if you avoid carburetors. No, I'm not avoiding carbohydrates. I'm just eating rice mostly. Or like pita bread. But I'm not eating like, uh, or potatoes, like, you know, like vegetable carbohydrates or starches. Like, I'm not avoiding carbohydrates completely. I'm just not eating a ton. I'm trying to hit my protein goals. But yeah, you do have to eat a little different when you're dieting, though, no matter what. There, you do have to a little bit. I can't be eating pizza every day, you know? I can't be doing that freelancer, self-employed, work-from-home diet where you order in Chinese food three times a week because you don't have time to cook. Can't do that. You have to eat differently in that regard. Um, a writing tutorial would be fun, but I have big time imposter syndrome. So like, even though I've written for a few things and I've published a few books and I've sold the TV show, I still feel like I haven't done enough to justify giving advice on that. Like if the, if the thing went to TV and I had written a bunch of episodes that actually got filmed and turned into things that people could watch. I'd be like, yeah, I've done enough to justify a writing tutorial. Like, I'd, I'd feel like more like able to charge for that and not feel like an imposter. But I don't know. I, I still feel like even though I've done some stuff in that field and I get paid for it, I still feel like I haven't done enough to justify charging for it. That might just be a me thing, but it, it feels like I would need to accomplish a bit more before I like you know, I'm, I'm happy giving advice for free on it and stuff and talking to people about it. And the thing I used to say all the time is, you know, on a scale of one to 10 or something like, or on a ladder, even if you're on the third rung of a ladder instead of the top, you can still help somebody from the bottom to get up to where you are. Like, you don't need to be a master artist to give critiques that can help people. I feel the same way about the writing stuff, but... I, I don't know. I have a weird I have a weird ego issue with charging for my stuff. I don't I don't feel like I've done enough to to really justify charging for it. It's the same reason I don't have a Patreon. I don't feel like my art's good enough to justify that yet. I'm too slow. I'm too I don't know. There's too much more I have to learn how to do. I'd feel very weird charging for it. But I can definitely like give advice and stuff. I just wouldn't charge for it. If people have questions about writing or anything we experience developing an IP, I'm happy to talk about it.
I'm gonna guess based on the... I'm gonna guess this is the scales that are flayed off and hanging. I'm gonna guess that texture on the bottom is from the scales on the other side kind of poking down into it. Not really sure from the looking at it what it is. Good book recommendations. Um, oh fuck, what was the name of it? Fuck. Um, hold on. Hold on. Do I have it written down? Fuck, I don't, do I? Fuck, I don't, do I? Um, hold on. Hold on. Book. Fiction, Night, Black, Plague, Pope. Between Two Fires. Watch, read Between Two Fires. Read Between Two Fires. Two Fires should be a Netflix show. Or an HBO show. Maybe I'll bring back the culture streams where I would put on an audiobook that was in the public domain and we'd listen to it together for the whole day. That might be funny. I think we did that with The Great Gatsby when The Great Gatsby movie came out. We just listened to it on stream for three days. Then we all went and saw the movie. Welcome to culture streams. Today, we listen to... I don't even know what it would be. Join us today as we listen to David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. The coming of age tale of a young boy struggling to find his place in a world not his own. D audiobooks are uh, not in the public domain. I'd have to listen to something that was not going to get me sued. Or my YouTube shut down, you know? Yeah, no. I also recommend uh, The Lost City of Z. Um, I'd also recommend um, The Terror 
which was made into a show. Uh, the show is pretty good, except the monster looks really stupid. Other than that, the show is really good, but the monster does look very bad, so just warning you. Um, but yeah. I'd recommend Drood. Drood is a little slower than the Terror, but it's still very good. Um, I'd recommend the Tommy Knockers, which is an older Stephen King book. The Terror is great. I read the Terror. I got pneumonia during COVID, and I thought I was gonna die, and no one could come like help me, and I couldn't get out of bed. The pneumonia was so bad, so I was stuck in bed for like a week, unable to breathe. And it was freezing cold outside, snowed in. It was just like the worst. And I read The Terror, and it was the perfect atmosphere. I was like sick, I was snowed in, everything sucked. It was just like, ugh, what a, what a, being sick sucked, and all that other shit associated with it sucked, but the experience of reading the book in those conditions was pretty awesome. But yeah. The aesthetics. I remember laughing a few times because characters were describing like symptoms I had. <laughs> I was like, this is very funny that I'm reading this right now under these conditions. Four and a half hours of streaming. I might not be on here super long. I do have to get up early and do some Easter stuff. figure this out. If anyone's got any last things they'd like to talk about or questions, throw them in the chat. I'm probably going to go in a minute because I still got to eat. 
Uh, I gotta eat, do laundry, do some more exercise, and uh, go to bed early enough to get up and do some Easter shit in the morning. I'll take my nephew for hunting, hunting Easter eggs. Might be back tomorrow for a stream. It'll be later in the day. It'll start around the same time this one started. If I'm here, it'll be between 3 and 5 EST, but no guarantee. Listen, Dead Man's Pixels. If you think part of my night isn't going to be playing Dragon's Dogma, you're very wrong, okay? You can just call me, or text me, and we can just talk about liches. What a terrible night to have a curse.
Well, I guess it's time for me to be uh, getting off of here, chat. Love you all. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny. I'm just about to leave. I got to go do some errands and get ready for tomorrow and get up early and hunt Easter eggs with a kiddo. and Yeah, man. Cook some shit. It's time for me to be getting off the old stream, you know? I'll be back, though. We got a whole bunch of snake left to paint. Whole bunch of snake left to paint, you know? Did I tell my family I was sick? So I wouldn't have to go to Easter and instead play Dragon's Dogma all day? Listen, man. I'll never tell. Either way. Hope you all have a wonderful Sunday, okay? Whatever you're doing. Whoever you're with. Wherever you're at. Have a lovely one. And before you know it, I'll be back in your ear. And we'll be here painting more snake scales in spooky viscera. So much goddamn viscera. Love you all. Sleep tight. Kisses. Amen.